talk is about machine unlearning. So machine unlearning is motivated by the so-called right to be forgotten, which means that any individual can request from a service provider that they delete the personal data. And this is a right that exists in Canada, European Union, and California. So deleting someone's personal data is really easy if you just have a database, right? You select the row and then you delete it and you're done. But it's a bit more difficult if you're talking about machine learning models. And this is where machine unlearning comes in. So what exact machine unlearning is defined as is that the probability distribution over the models that you could train on a data set without the data points to be deleted has to be exactly equal to the probability distribution that whatever machine unlearning method you use uh, produces if you give it a model that was trained on the full data set and then tell it which points to remove. And you could fulfill this by simply throwing away the model and retraining from scratch, but that is, of course, quite time and energy intensive. So uh, I'm going to talk about CISA, which stands for Sharded, Isolated, Sliced, and Aggregated Training. And so far, this is actually the only exact unlearning technique uh, that works for deep neural nets. Uh, the other ones only work for regression. So how does CISA work? Let's say you have some kind of data set D. Uh, the first step you are going to do is divide up that data set into disjoint shards. And then uh, each of these shards, you're going to further divide up into disjoint slices. And of course, these numbers are high parameters that you can change. But in this example, we're just going to use three. And then on each shard, uh, you would train one model. So how you, exactly are you doing that? Um, you would start with a random initialization and then train for some number of epochs on slice one. Then you would save your model weights, uh, train for some number of epochs on slice one and two and so on. Save the weights again until you've trained on the entire shard. Uh, why do you do that? Well, the reason is that if someone that uh, was represented in slice three asks for their data to be deleted, you don't have to start from the beginning, but you can use the second checkpoint and only repeat epoch five and six. And that results in an additional speed up besides the sharding. And then at inference time, you just use the models that you have and assemble them and use the final prediction. So uh, CISA was published in 2020 and the authors uh, measured an average speed up of between four and two and four times uh, compared to retraining from scratch. Um, and the uh, trade-off that you have is that you have uh, a decrease in the accuracy of your models. So they had between one and 10 percentage points, depending on the task. Uh, and they reported this as average accuracy over the entire task. Um, the data sets they used were either perfectly balanced or they had a slight imbalance, but even if they did, so for example, for ImageNet, we only know that the accuracy decrease that was associated with CISA is about 10 percentage points, but not how that actually, uh, like the actual effect it had on like majority or minority classes. So the question we wanted to answer is, does CISA have a special impact on imbalanced data sets? And you will not be surprised if you read the title that the answer to that is yes. So what we have done is we just take one balanced data set. In this case, it's extended MNIST with like 240,000 images. And we introduce artificial imbalances at random. And this means uh, imbalance ratios between one and 10 up to one to a thousand. And uh, this is quite high, but in many data sets in reality, for example, in the medical domain, these imbalances do exist. So what you would expect if you just trained one big model in a data set like this is something like that, right? On the majority class, you have a very low error rate. And then as the imbalance ratio rises, your error rate goes up. And this is also exactly what you would observe or what we did observe uh, when training one big model. Now, if I tell you that if you apply CISA to this, uh, the average uh, performance decreases three percentage points, you would suspect something like this, right? And all of the classes suffer some kind of decrease in their performance, but it's more or less evenly distributed. But this is not what you actually see in practice. So the results from our experiment show something like this. The majority class stays almost unchanged in the performance, but the error rates of the minority classes have this huge increase. And the biggest, uh, like the smallest minority in our case, actually peaked out at like 100% error rate, so 0% accuracy. And this is not good. Another way to look at this would be to look at the relationship between minority and majority. So before, for example, the 1 to 100 minority had a uh, error rate that was 14 times as high as the majority, but because the majority stayed almost unchanged, uh, this new relationship becomes it's 40 times as high. And that's, of course, also not good. 
So uh, what you could ask is, okay, well, this apparently seems to be an issue with imbalanced data sets. So maybe methods that help against class imbalances in general would help. And it turns out they do help. So for example, you see this 14 times multiple gets lower if you use these methods such as cost sensitive learning or also combinations with different loss functions. We use focal loss and label distribution away margin loss. But what stays the same is that if you additionally use CESA to train these models, uh, this uh, multiple gets higher. So the, the relationship between minority and majority class gets more uh, imbalanced. But this is not the only way in which you can achieve um, a retraining time speed up, right? CESA is a technique that makes retraining faster, but you can also make retraining of a model faster by simply making your data set smaller, just throw away data. And one such method um, would, for example, be random undersampling. And random undersampling is a technique um, that also helps against class imbalance, right? You don't remove samples at random, but you remove samples of the majority class. And it turns out to achieve a speed up that is equivalent to a CESA model with S shards, you have to uh, train on a data set that has a size uh, with a factor of one divided by square root of S. So in, in the example we had, where we had three uh, shards, uh, this would mean removing about 40% of the data set. And it turns out if you do this, you can achieve um, relations between minority and majority class that are much better than training just one big model in the first place. So in this case, we were able to actually lower on that, that relationship between minority and minor majority class uh, from 14 to 11 or eight to four times as much. And not only does this make this performances more similar, also, when you look at the absolute error rates, it improves the minority class error rates uh, much more than any combination did with CESA. So observation one would be that random undersampling uh, provides a better minority class performance than CESA, and it has the um, retraining time speed up essentially as a free add-on. And the second observation, and this will be what I'm going to talk about in the second part of this presentation, is that not everyone is equally likely to request the data to be deleted, and this can also cause some issues. So if, if you assign samples at random to slices and shards, you're going to get the method that I described previously. But CESA has an adaptive setting where you can additionally sort samples depending on if they have a low or high unlearning likelihood in the first place. So if you have individuals from whom you suspect that they are highly likely to submit an unlearning request, you could either place them into fewer shards or the later train slices, and both of these methods would result in an additional speed up to CESA. Uh, and it turns out that uh, such correlations actually exist, and you can estimate how likely someone is to submit an unlearning request. Uh, in the original paper, they said, okay, well, which country you're coming from might be a variable, but there's more than just which country you're coming from. So for example, this is a survey from 2020. And it turns out that if you are richer or if you are younger, this means you have a higher likelihood of submitting unlearning requests. And this also correlates with, for example, having ever changed your privacy settings. So if I were a social network and I would estimate your likelihood to submit an unlearning request by whether or not you have ever changed your privacy settings, I would get exactly that pattern. So the problem that this uh, yeah, what this creates is that class label in your task and unlearning likelihood can be correlated. So imagine you are training a disease classifier, then obviously the samples that have the disease label are going to be older and as a sad reality, also on average poorer than uh, yeah, an average citizen. So does this create problems with CESA? Uh, we looked at this by repeating essentially the experiments from before and then artificially increasing or lowering uh, the average unlearning likelihood that a service provider might assign to a specific um, sample. And it turns out if you use the approach where you assign the high unlikelihood, uh, high unlearning likelihood samples to fewer shards, uh, the minority classes that we've seen before become even worse, right? The error rate gets even higher. However, if you assign them to later trained slices, there exists a setting in which if they have a lower unlearning likelihood, which we saw before was the case for people that are older or uh, poorer, you can actually uh, increase their performance. And also, you are able to reverse this behavior uh, by creating a slight modification to CESA, 
uh, which uh, is the removal of the unioning step. So what do I mean by this? Um, if you remember this slide, you can see that as the training progresses, we make the data set that we are training on larger and larger by unioning the slices. And this uh, reverse behavior you can achieve uh, by actually not doing that, and instead training for more epochs on one specific slice, uh, and then never visiting it again. So essentially, this is repeated fine tuning. So uh, essentially, uh, no matter whether or not uh, whether your class has a positive correlation with unlearning likelihood or a negative correlation with unlearning likelihood, uh, you can always select some kind of training regime in which that class benefits. But you should also pay attention and measure and measure um, which correlation exists because you don't want to be in these red squares, obviously. So what are the takeaways? So I guess the first one would be that CESA is not equally suited for all types of learning problems. So as you could see, if you have a class imbalance of only one to 10, this already means that a really primitive approach, such as random undersampling, can provide an equivalent speed up for retraining while also giving you a better minority class performance. And the second one is that just recording the average accuracy is not really sufficient to determine whether or not an unloading technique is really suited for all kinds of learning problems. So uh, depending on the data set you're using, it might actually make sense to use a different approach. And then the second or like the third takeaway here would be that it's really important to measure the unloading likelihood correlations that exist within the data set you are training on, and then using them wisely if you're using an adaptive CESAR strategy. And I think I was a bit fast with my presentation because I'm already at the end, but I guess that means we have more time for questions.